You're back with your ninth studio album. Um, I'm intrigued. Why did you put the dash in cello? Because it sells zero. Okay. <laughs> That's why we put it. It reminded me of Jello. <laughs> oh yeah. There was another person saying like, and then I think, does our music remind of this green jelly thing? No, but it's a uh, yeah. It sells zero. And what is cell uh, zero? Cell zero is a imaginary particle that we came up with. You could call it like a god particle, something the artwork has got a lot to do with the tiny particles like the album cover you probably have seen, there's the cello which splinters in these small pieces and we were thinking a lot of different themes when we were creating the album and one of the things we were thinking were these particles, how they create tiny small particles create bigger entities and uh, whether it's a piece of a, if you think in a like very small like atom level and a lot of atoms they create something or uh, if you put cells together you can create something which could be whatever form uh, but the that doesn't explain everything there needs to be something something undefined something uh, like uh, that you cannot pinpoint, kind of like a God particle, something that creates the thing within. If you also, if you think music, there's uh, tiny particles that create a song. You take notes, you take breaks, you take uh, pauses, all that. And when you put it together, that's almost a song. But to actually make a song with emotion and something in it, you need the cell zero. You need that extra piece, something that you cannot make uh, mark down as a note, it's that X factor thing. It's mysticism. Kind, kind of, yeah. And then also we were talking, we were talking so much, uh, we talk all the time, but also we were talking about kind of like the element of uh, uh, kind of like cell zero being maybe the that thing that people have lost like uh, in the past years especially the ability to be uh, to feel empathy the ability, uh, ability to connect with nature to connect with other people to show respect for uh, the earth for the animals for other human beings and something that if we don't find that thing back we will kind of be in big trouble in the final and that's the, the kind of like all the current situations all of a sudden has got a lot of negative vibe to it how the world is evolving so from that kind of in, environmental political aspect down to the music down to uh, uh, those tiny particles then that can be combined and one thing more like if you think people how how super skilled human beings are to put those particles together to create something, whether it's a microchip, whether it's a, a structures, whether it's buildings or statues or something, human beings have been become super talented in creating those. And at the same time, human beings use more effort, more money to break things apart. People rather invest money on guns and war than they do put in taking care of like uh, people in need and uh, kind of all that combined is the world of Cell Zero. Well, you mentioned that it's interesting because I think the songs, the theme is very socio-political, uh, where you explore in a very instrumental but yet very poignant way all that's wrong with the world today. Like you said, nature and relationships between people and all the wars going on. Uh, is it difficult to express yourself without words? Um, when you play, does it help you to imagine these words and to help you bring out the emotion? Yeah, and uh, the thing is that uh, our aim is not to answer the questions. Our aim is to ignite the sparkle so people would have the question. And that's kind of like in instrumental music, that's the cool thing that we don't need to come up even with the half of a story. We just give kind of like the loose frame for people. We give the uh, album name, we give the song names, we give the album artwork 
and everything else is abstract, everything else is music. And then people take those hints what we give and then they create their own stories. And that's the interesting part. And therefore, much more than I'm interested of telling stories myself, I'm much more interested to hear what did you feel, what was your interpretation of that song or that uh, setting what we gave. And uh, that that's the, really the strength of uh, uh, instrumental music in general. Why did you decide to go back to doing instrumental album? That goes, actually, now this will take four years, this explanation, because it goes maybe four years back. Uh, previous studio album is Shadowmaker, what we did, I think, 2015 or 14, I think, we recorded maybe. And uh, that was the fourth album in a row where we were highly concentrating on the vocal tracks. There were lots of vocal tracks and uh, a lot of the vocal tracks we wanted to be kind of like songs that could be played on radio and uh, great albums all together. And then after Shadowmaker we did this two years tour. And uh, after that we realized, hey, now it's 20 years since we released the first album. So let's do a small anniversary tour of Place Metallica by Four Cellos. Instrumental album, what the first Apocalyptic album we did. So we set up the whole thing. We do 20, 30 shows in the biggest cities in Europe, a couple in the States, one in South America and whatnot. We put the gigs out and all of a sudden huge demand. Like all the promoters keep calling enormous feedback from the fans that we want to hear it. So we start to sell more gigs and more gigs and more gigs and then it gets totally out of hands, ending up so that the, the celebration tour was supposed to take maybe two months maximum and we thought that we will go studio after that. It expanded to two and a half years, 230 shows, 47 countries, like out, out, totally out of hands. Uh, great thing is that uh, we had lots of fun. Our fans loved it. And it brought us to see that how excited our fans were when we were playing kind of like the very core music of Apocalyptica. Cello music, progressive metal music with that very unique instrument in a very unique way. And while being on that tour that never ended, uh, we kind of like started to think that maybe we should actually create something more of this style that people so much want to hear. And we wanted to do actually kind of that album to show our, our thanks to fans that th th it's amazing that you've been with us and we see how much you have wanted it and waited for us to do something like that. After 17 years, it's the first instrumental album and the more we thought of, of it the more natural and more kind of like important it felt for us that we need to do one of those albums now after all the vocal albums we've done not to say that we wouldn't do vocal tracks but just that let's make one of those albums and then it was actually great when we did the decision to kind of like how the world opened that now as we are in this like sandbox it's way bigger sandbox actually than when making uh, vocal tracks because then you need to kind of like follow the rules much more when you're doing artistic instrumental metal music there you can do whatever just make good music that you believe in yourself and therefore it was, it was super inspirational and creative process then when we started to write the tracks and all that but uh, so that was the not quite four year long story but the long story <laughs> what what led us to the decision to make that album and I'm not finished yet so also when we when we kind of like realized that this is the album we're gonna do we thought that okay we've always worked with amazing producers from Jakob Heller to Joe Barisi to Nick Rasculinex to everyone like top of the line best rock producers in the world and then we thought okay we have this strong idea that we want to do this kind of an album we want to go back to the rules how we did everything who would be the best producer in the world to do this? Ah, Apocalyptica. They produce amazing Apocalyptica music. And that's how we decided that we will produce the album by ourselves as well. And it was mixed uh, by someone very, very famous who did some very yes. famous albums. Yes. Why did you choose uh, Andrew Sheps? Uh, <laughs> just because of the reasons you said. <laughs> it's amazing. Amazing mixing. We have had just like ridiculously good mixing engineers from uh, Stefan Glaumann, who mixed all the Rammstein albums, and to Frisol Lord Alci, who I don't even need, need to say who he is, and to Rich Costi, to Michael Brower has done us mixes, and uh, uh, 
Greg Fiddleman. It's just ridiculous how good guys we have had. But uh, Andrew Sheps has always been one of those guys we have always wanted to work with. And especially with this album, uh, as we wanted to make kind of like the uh, utmost embrace for the cello instrument. We wanted to tweak every tiniest bit out of the instrument we ever could. And we spent lots of time for arrangements to find all the ways how we can uh, kind of like deliver the full emotional variety of that instrument to people. And uh, kind of the way of recording, way of arranging, way of everything, all the way to the moment when we gave those tracks to Andrew Sheps and explained him, this is what we want. We, the natural vibe, the breathing, all when we go soft and fragile, we want it to be softest and fragilest ever done. And when we go extreme, we want it to be more extreme than ever anything ever what we've done before and everything in between. And he totally understood what we were after. And he was able to emphasis all those tiny little different features and to lift the album even to the next level. It was a highly, highly inspirational uh, experience to work with him. And I'm a big fan of all kinds of mixing engineers and uh, all kinds of music. And for me, it especially was like a super, super important experience to get him on board. Well, this is your, I think, your most progressive album yet. Did you have, did you feel very uh, liberated to be able to explore all these different avenues? Yeah, and that was something, all of a sudden we also realized that there have been some things that we have ourselves limited out. That, yeah, we, we cannot do that kind of stuff because, and then now being in the studio, yeah, we cannot do that. Why? Well, be because. Yeah, why? Well, we can do that. Yes, we can do that. So then we kind of challenge ourselves that let's get out of those restrictions we have built ourselves to, uh, upon us. And uh, so very di uh, liberating uh, feeling to uh, explore everything around music. And therefore there are like, I don't know, have you heard the whole album yet? Yes. Yeah, and that like really a huge variety of moods, at least to uh, our ears. And uh, yeah, it was fun. And then we felt that, oh, we could just do more and more and more. It sounds like a soundtrack sometimes because of all the emotions that go up and down. And uh, I was watching your video for Rise mm. and it's extremely cinematic and very uh, aesthetic. Uh, it's, it's like, a, you know, Tim Walker, a fashion photographer. It's more like his features in Vogue mixed with uh, some artsy cinema. Um, are you involved in the video making? Are you involved in the aesthetics? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we, we work together in that video with the Canadian like a movie artist, Lisa Mann, and we have a long relationship with her. She did, we originally, originally met her when she did a I Don't Care video for us. And then because we liked it so much and she's such an amazing person, uh, we asked her to do also Broken Pieces, End of Me and Not Strong Enough for Seventh Symphony, which was kind of like a trilogy video. Like those three videos had a continuous story. And now for this, especially with Thrice song, we, we know how amazing she is with pictures, with colors, with themes and all that. And we kind of like gave her a loose frame for that song. We talked about hope, we talked about uh, light, we talked about possibilities to rise if something is pressing you down. And then we told her, do your art, that we are big fans of your art and please, uh, we are happy if we can uh, be part of your art piece and she's as I said she's absolutely stunning uh, artist and and actually she will or she directed also the next video which will come out very soon and uh, like I said we are big fans of her and uh, the the music videos to me as well is it's really amazing beautiful piece and what is the next video I don't know can I say it I, I can't <laughs> you, yeah, yeah you like this yes you can no I can't Ooh, but but it will come out soon I don't know I should know when it's coming out Roger when it's coming. Uh, I think in a few weeks okay. yeah. and 
in a few weeks in January, you guys are embarking on this crazy tour schedule. And you're touring Europe with Sabaton, yeah. your, their special guests. Are you acquainted with the band? How did you, that collaboration come about? Yeah, I could call them my friends even now. Uh, we met them first time maybe one and a half years ago. Pär, who is their bass player, he came to say hi to us. We were on a tour and he had an idea that he came to see the show. Just He said, I just want to see your show. And he came there and after the show he really liked it. It was the place Metallica show he saw. And and said that, yeah, they've been thinking that they want to do this kind of like a tour. And he said that they find it to be maybe a bit old school and maybe a bit boring way that there's support band, maybe another support band, and then there's a main act and that's the tour. And he said, there needs to be a better way of doing that than what they had been thinking was that they wanted to kind of it to be growing and more inclusive combination. So for the tour, like for that uh, gig setting, everything is intertwined together. Uh, Amarante, who is the opening act, uh, Pert will go to play with them cello for one song. Then their singer Elise, she will come to sing with us for two songs. And then we will go to play together with Sabaton for five songs for their set. So the whole evening is kind of like going like this. And on top of that, which I thought that, that that's amazing idea and so inspiring, but I thought that on top of that, that let's, let's create something new, let's make some music, let's give our fans even more something to be happy with. And so what we did, we did a version of their uh, song Fields of Verdun, we did song together with them, Angels Calling, and there's even more to come than when we are on tour. And that's kind of like, I think it's so bright thinking, they are Swedes, they are Swedes are like, just like that, they are enormous with coming up with ideas. and. Uh, so it's really great, kind of like it will be marked as an era, like when you check back that that was the time when they created so much things together, not only a tour, but music and all kinds of like things for fans. So I don't think anybody has ever done that. I, I haven't heard that anyone would have. Yeah. I said they are amazing. Yeah, well, you'll be here in Paris in February. Yeah, 7th of uh, February in Zenith. And you mentioned that um, you were going to LA next week to record some songs. What is that? Yeah, like the Cell Zero is a strong instrumental concert album that we are proudest of. Uh, but as part of Apocalyptica has been for longest time already, also vocal tracks. So we don't let go of that. We wanted to make the instrumental albums for the reasons I explained, but we also want to make vocal tracks. So we do vocal tracks. They are not on the album. They will be released in other form well, later when I tell you. I, I don't know when they are released. I have no idea. I just play drums. But uh, anyway, that, that's the idea that we continue making music all the time and we don't let go of that side of us as well. That being said, the main focus, of course, now being in that instrumental music we just created. And lyrically, uh, yeah, have you guys written the lyrics yet to the songs? For like the hell, no. There's three cello players from Finland. You don't want to hear what they would like to say. Drummer from Finland, you definitely don't want to hear what I would like to say. So therefore, we embrace great lyricists and uh, we take, take better persons to write the lyrics than <laughs> us. <laughs> Imagine if I spent all my life hitting things like this. Do you think too much is going up here? Mm -mm. I couldn't even write like stories for, I don't know what punk band, not non-punk bands. <laughs> well, maybe you can, you know, take out your anger on the drums and... Never anger. Never. That's a misconcept. You don't hit things because you're anger. You create them to be happy. Like in a Christmas song, you little drummer boy, that's... Power up a pump pump. You should record that. Yeah, we have. Echo made, yeah, yeah, yeah. Echo made the verse. I think that's actually. That's kind of like the first original composition of Apocalyptic. In a way, it's, it's a cover of that song, but Echo wrote additional parts to that song. It's, it's really funny. There's some stupid versions of it which we recorded live. 12 years ago, something, and uh, yeah, but, but you need to just a little drummer by, uh, okay, by Apocalypse. Yeah, it's cool. 
And you guys also released the, the live album uh, Metallica. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any, any other band that you would like to cover? We will cover another band, but I cannot tell you which one. But not for a whole album. So uh, to do an album worth of some band, I don't think there would ever be another band than Metallica. That sounded almost like really just don't keep other bands, but then Metallica. No. So, yeah, that's like uh, we're huge Metallica fans. We are huge Metallica fans, of course. Yeah.